We're ready to kick off for our second talk tonight. Um, so our second speaker tonight is Adam Shah. Adam Shah is Principal of Adam, Adam Shah Architects and Professor of Architecture at Newcastle University. He is the co-editor of ARQ, series editor of Thinkers for Architects, and he's the author of Heidegger for Architects 2007, Heidegger's Hut in 2006, and Reading Architecture and Culture 2012. His talk tonight is titled, A House with One Wall. Please welcome Adam Shah. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I have a love-hate relationship with philosophy. Um, I like the way it helps me to puzzle through, as an architect, what I do when I design. And also I like that it helps me to puzzle through how architecture works in the world. But I dislike, talking, uh, I dislike how talking to nearly everybody about philosophy makes me feel that I'm somehow weird, certainly in the rather anti-intellectual culture of construction in Britain. I've been working with a project manager recently to whom even talk of shadow and colour seems dangerously irrational, topics to be dismissed as soon as possible to return to surer ground. And I know that any mention of Graham Harmon and his, philosoph his metaphysical system would have me marched off that site for good. In this way, philosophy can easily become an inward pursuit for an architect. While my first books were about Heidegger, my recent writing has been focused on close readings of particular architectures. I've been following ideas which seem important to me, but it's also work which I can talk about with regular folk that hasn't had them making quick excuses to leave. So I'm immensely grateful to the organisers for prompting me to engage with Harmon's work and for the opportunity to spend an evening with you all as consenting architectural philosophers. Um, now, in the spirit of Graham Harmon's force fields, strange force fields between objects, I'm just going to let the slides do their own thing while I talk, in the hope that when I come to talk about particular things, the slide will be there. It may, it may not, but that <laughs> seems to be part of it all. Graham Harmon's book, Circus Philosophicus, billed in the blurb as Platonic Myth Meets American Noir, provides the most vivid depictions of his object-oriented philosophy. It's also his most architectural book, I would argue, most obviously because it discusses six made artefacts, a Ferris wheel, a bridge, tiny calliopes, an offshore drilling rig, a haunted boat, and a flag with a sleeping zebra, which he uses to illustrate the transactions of the radically object-centred world that Harmon has proposed. But it also seems architectural because it approached chimes with how architects think. The book offers a series of productive fables that allow us to imagine our surroundings differently. This is exactly the kind of storytelling, the production of imaginative worlds, to which architects devote their work lives. Finding ourselves in a construction industry that prefers the quantitative metrics offered by other consultants, the cost certainty promised by quantity surveyors, and the consistent lux levels calculated by electrical engineers, Architects can only persuade through their stories. We can't promise that our designs will make a house 72% better or make an office 27% more productive, but we can tell a convincing story about how its qualities, its organisation, its outlook and its interiors can make atmospheres for the client which will feel more dignified, more lively or more productive. It's through the powerful evocation of imaginative worlds that we're able to encourage clients to invest in our designs. And these fictions, which are more real in many ways than the competing fictions con conjured through accounting spreadsheets and engineering calculations, remain architect's stock in trade. This paper tells a story about a house with one wall. When I first proposed the title, my conceit was that this house could join the Circus Philosophicus. But, while it may be visible over the fence of that particular fairground, I realised that it sits outside its perimeter. The house exists primarily as part of another global theme park, which I will call the Circus Architectura, a fairground that collects together from all seven continents the disparate artefacts of the architectural canon, some built, some unbuilt, some demolished, as published in books, journals and blogs. The house with one wall was designed by the Venezuelan-born Swiss architect Christian Keres for a site in Zurich, finished in 2007. I know the house well, although I've never seen it with my own eyes. The time I've spent there has been in the pages of the architecture magazine El Croque, where I've pored over its plans, um, its sections and its photographs, admiring the creativity and the intellectual integrity of the architecture. 
On one hand, the fabric and disposition of the house seem to have a correspondence with Harman's philosophy. On the other, it exemplifies the operations of the circus architectura, the group of imaginary objects which shape architecture as most architects understand it, an architectural universe which exists in architects' minds and whose presence is reasserted whenever those architects design. I will begin with the Circus Philosophicus with a brief review of Harman's fair ground of objects, which is overshadowed by the revolutions of a giant Ferris wheel. I will then address the house with one wall, examining its parallels with Harman's philosophical ideas, and I will conclude with a view of the Circus Architectura, of which the house with one wall is a part, considering another view of the canon of architecture as a dynamic shifting force field of objects which is decisive to the imagination of new architectures. So, to the Circus Philosophicus first of all. Harman's philosophical circus presents a picture of the world. His philosophy proposes a total cosmic infrastructure, a world comprised of objects which are always immediately present and whose immediacy goes far beyond their usefulness to us. Harman has extended the account of tools from Martin Heidegger's magnum opus Being in Time, as discussed before, where, he where Heidegger argued that tools demonstrate to us the fundamental presence of our being, to claim that objects are not just ready for us to use or present to our use, but that tool being fundamentally characterises the things of the world and our life in it. All is present reality, Harman argues, constituted by objects in the broadest definition of that word, and there is no background truth. There is no need here for descriptive metaphors. Objects as tools are always themselves, first and foremost. It doesn't help much to think of things being like other things or representative of other things in Harman's universe. Each of the objects, he has argued, rumbles in its depths, unleashing powerful forces in its ceaseless duels and friendships with the others. Harman's philosophical world finds mythical reality in the gigantic Ferris wheel of many miles, miles, many miles in diameter that he asks us to picture in Circus Philosophicus. Quote, the wheel would be lodged in a massive trench in the earth with the hub at ground level. At all times, the wheel would be half above ground and half beneath the surface. Over the course of 12 or 14 hours, the wheel would make a complete circuit high in the air and deep beneath the soil. It would carry thousands of separate cars, each of them loaded with various objects. Some would contain printed documents or zinc and molybdenum buddhas. Others would be loaded with colourful flags, electric generators, reptiles and birds, miniature explosive charges, bottles of wine, da tap dancers, brass, brass bands playing military music and other entities circling day and night. A series of underground chambers are also part of the wheel's infrastructure, located either side of its subterranean path. These rooms extend the menagerie of objects in the wheel's orbit. Quote, For instance, one of the rooms would be occupied by the members of a secret society, they have perhaps assembled for a celebration, but with strict orders to wait calmly until the special flag of their group passes by. There are poets writing verse in some of the rooms, their moods affected deeply by all of the objects, but especially by the various musical groups that circle past. Some of the rooms contain rabid dogs that bark at all passing objects, but especially at the cats and foxes that sometimes circle by, pushing the dogs toward a state of frenzy. Let's suppose as well that one of these underground chambers contains the main electric generator for the town above. From time to time, a huge electromagnetic coil circles past this room, disrupting the town's energy supply for several minutes. End quote. The wheel, in conjunction with the chambers surrounding it, becomes an agent of radical juxtaposition, counterposing objects in a shifting and almost endless series of permutations. Boy meets girl, meets rabid dog, meets Masonic ritual, meets generator, meets cockatiels, meets knitting circle, meets anything and everything else in a system so huge and unfathomable, un unfathomable that its sequence of events remain effectively impossible to anticipate. But this is not just a benign conspiracy of coincidences. Harmon again, quote, With the exception of the eternal wheel itself, each of the entities in this myth faces a certain degree of danger. After all, some of the cars contain explosive devices. No one knows when or how powerfully they might detonate. If these explode while transiting underground, the chambers closest to them will be annihilated without hope of survivors. Yet, the danger also works in reverse, with some of the underground rooms posing a threat to the objects riding the wheel. 
For instance, a number of the subterranean rooms might be equipped with dormant furnaces. At sporadic intervals and random temperatures, jets of flame suddenly erupt from the room towards the car that's passing by, spraying fire on whatever entity it contains. End quote. <clears throat> The giant Ferris wheel, Harmon implies, is a picture of the world which we inhabit, being ourselves human objects. It doesn't just conjure up a cycle of strange juxtapositions. It frequently contrives situations where objects activate or neutralise one another, where objects act acting in concert conspire to reshape themselves or each other according to the visible or invisible force fields that they enact together. The panoply of objects loaded onto the wheel have together something like a basic sentience. The wheel is a microcosm, or maybe more accurately a macrocosm, of the ever-shifting and endlessly multiple choreography of objects whose world we are always and inevitably part of. To offer an architectural parallel, designers will be familiar with the phenomenon of bimetallic or galvanic action, where certain metals shouldn't be placed together because when they join, they electrolyze each other and speed up each other's rate of decay. Locating zinc next to stainless steel, for example, will cause both metals to corrode uh, and destroy themselves much faster than they would corrode alone. These juxtapositions, while they're conventionally to be avoided, also offer an opportunity if an architect, according to some perverse logic, wants to design a building that decays itself. In Harman's philosophical world, the galvanic series, the table of corroding metals, is infinitely expanded beyond metals to incorporate objects of all materials, including plastic, concrete, and flesh, encompassing everything at any scale, charting endless benign or malevolent interactions. Harman's Wheel of Fortune is, to some extent, aligned with philosophers like Alfred North Whitehead and Bruno Latour, who focus on the per pervasive interrelations of things and discount the existence of entities outside their effects. It also, he argues, illustrates the limits of their thinking, that no object, whatever its destructive or benign power, can be reduced solely to the sum of its effects. Actuality, Harman argued, is always more than just potential. An object cannot be exhausted by the various events in which it's implicated. To this extent, any object must always remain a mystery. What needs to be discovered, wrote Harman, is an actuality different from all events, but one that belongs to plutonium, armies, flocks of geese, and Hindu epics no less than to atoms. This picture of an object-oriented ontology inevitably raises the question of what constitutes an object. In Circus Philosophicus, Harman wrote about a calliope, a spectacular steam-powered musical instrument playing, playing sweet and sour melodies slightly out of key, which he found himself sat next to on a Chennai beach. This invincible machine, he argued, is encountered not as a sum of individual qualities comprising an underlying thing, but, rather, is found as a whole, so that the eerie and underlying style of the object imbues all of the isolated songs and notes that emanate from it. An object's wholeness comes about neither by comprising this just the sum of its smaller parts, nor by being comprised of a unity of pieces. An object, he argued, is always, in the instant, a thing unto itself. Quote, just as the calliope was independent of the specific notes it played at each moment, and separate as well from its shifting effects on me and the other listeners on the beach, so too it achieved an, auto an autonomous life over and above its component pieces. Never could the calliope be dismissed as a mere aggregate, since most of its pieces could be removed, replaced, shuffled or altered without the calliope ceasing to be what it was. The calliope was no less unified than the simplest hydrogen atom, yet this fact did not entail an absence of substance, substance and aggregate. End quote. To relate this to another architectural example, the object as Harman imagines it can be akin to an ancient Japanese Buddhist temple. The temple has remained ostensibly the same object for generations, its pebble landscapes having been combed meticulously in the same pattern every day for hundreds of years, every one of its timbers having been carefully replaced when its pattern of age eventually became decay. Yet, like the fabled broom that's had eight new heads and four new handles, no part of the temple remains from the time of its first construction. Despite these multiple constructions and reconstructions, the temple is always still the temple. This ontology is not about construction in language, but instead about a radical self-construction of objects. 
The wholeness of the temple as an object and its power in a world full of objects comes from always being at once complete and incomplete, forever being immediate while also comprising pasts and futures, always being both itself, made up of parts, and a constituent part. According to Harmon, objects aren't only graspable things like, say, a hammer or a jug. Objects can be real even if they aren't seen to exist. In the instant, a mythical creature like a mermaid or a unicorn can be at least as tangible as a rabid dog or a generator. Indeed, an event can also be an object. An evening party, for example, like that held by the secret society who've been waiting underground for the Ferris wheel to pass, is every bit as powerful an entity uh, and can exert itself just as tangibly as an exploding stick of gelignite or a giant magnetic coil. Objectness in the wheel world is hugely diverse. That said, its ontology is not completely flat with every object equal to every other object. Some objects are sometimes assertive and emergent, while others are latent. As Harmon puts it, they shift between sleeps of, uh, states of sleep and wakefulness. In Harmon's universe, humans are objects too. Likewise, so are their encounters. And so too are the cultures that gather around objects. But these human encounters and cultures, like human objects themselves, have no inherent right to special status in the endless shifting matrix of object relations. While architects who deal in the design of things might be quite comfortable with a world where objecthood is paramount, this is where Harmon's depiction of the world seems most challenging to many academics. Where, in this picture, is human perception, cognition and psychology? Where are the long histories of deep cultures? Where are the habits and practices, habits and practices presumed to emerge from them? Indeed, where are agency and political commitment? Is it that, in Harmon's universe, humans are merely passive objects caught up in the force fields among objects of which they are a part? At the end of Circus Philosophicus, Harmon conjured a mental picture of a zebra asleep by a fire, a reverie inspired by a flag with a sleeping zebra device seen from the window of Bruno Latour's flat in Paris. Everything perceives insofar as it relates, Harmon wrote, quote, when the zebra perceives the abandoned campfire, we have seen that this object is merely phenomenal or sensual. It would be easy to regard this experience, and all others, as occurring on the inside of the mind, that of the zebra. But recall that the zebra's mind is just one ingredient in this situation, and the campfire another. The encounter between zebra and fire is not two things, but also one, the experience as a whole. And when something is one, it instantly acquires the status of object. The world is perhaps filled with countless entities that exist without any current impact and which might never have any. While the fashionable doctrine today is that things are real only because they have effects, in fact, the reverse is true. They can have effects only because they are real. End quote. So it's in the self-constitution of an object as a rabid dog, or a bomb, or a party, or a Buddhist temple, that it becomes for Harmon a one, an entity, an object. And this constitution lends it power in the eternal revolutions of the wheel world. Habits, practices, perceptions, human or otherwise, become real because of their effects, he would argue. This reality, which transpires from something's power to deflect the force fields of inter-object relations, gives it a unity and therefore equips it with object status. But an object is always comprised of other objects and is involved in comprising other objects. Its unity is thus multiple. In another book, The Quadruple Object, Harman develops this further by arguing, following Heidegger, that any object's relations with its surroundings are always fourfold. Rather than Heidegger's quadraphonics of earth, sky, divinities and mortals, Harman prefers tensions of time and space and essence and eidos. All objects negotiate these pairings, he claimed, in their multiple oneness. And it's through their multiple oneness, always sleeping in any object, that an object acquires its power. Concluding Circus Philosophicus, he wrote, quote, By being withdrawn from the world as sleeping objects, we are unfree rather than free. Being just what we are, we are incapable of anything else. Yet, in a sense, we are always inside the world through the fact that we are made of pieces, and only therefore are we free, with our components doing the work of liberty on our behalf. 
For there is an excess in our pieces beyond what is needed to create us. And this excess allows new and unexpected things to happen. And so it is with all objects. We are awakened neither by our own powers nor by the world outside, but by the swarming landscape within. The pieces we never exhaust or master despite exceeding them. The dormant zebra, like all other objects, awaits a hailstorm from below. End quote. Objects are comprised of multiple latent potentials which may or may not ever be activated. It is this excess, Harmon claims, which constitutes an object in its agency, that very agency constituting another kind of object by virtue of its real effects. Okay. Next, we will travel through Harmon's objects-induced hailstorm from the Circus Philosophicus to the house with one wall, from the metaphysics of the wheel to the almost unbelievable physics of a singular architectural structure whose object quality seems especially intense. Where are we with the slides? Uh, for architects who admire such things, the architectural organisation of the house with one wall, its diagram, has a remarkable intellectual clarity. The building appears simple from the outside, but it remains a complex object of contemplation. To start with, the house is in fact two houses. They aren't placed side by side in straightforward semi-detached detached fashion, nor are they placed one above the other as maisonettes. Instead, the two dwellings interlock vertically, overlapping between floors, but always separated either side of the one eponymous wall. The plan might or might not have been there. The steel reinforced concrete wall offsets differently at each level, making jagged pockets of space. Its configuration establishes the interlocking volumes, but most strikingly provides a demonstration of structural acrobatics worthy of an agile circus performer. Notably, the house has no perimeter columns or additional structural walls, and the perimeter glazing is a non structural curtain wall. The concrete floor slabs are therefore only wholly uh, are therefore wholly cantilevered from the one jagged central wall. The house's structural stability therefore comes only from the floor slabs, working in conjunction with the offsetting cranks in the wall to balance out the forces at work. So you have these three walls at different levels, each offsetting differently, with floor slabs in between, and the balance of them is what keeps the house stable. The house operates right at the edge of structural possibility. It's barely credible physics, making its continued survival remarkable. Its refined structural integrity gives it a powerful integrity as an object. It equips the architecture with an inward logic all of its own. Its system of balance is self-sustaining and largely self-referential. The house has a formidable integrity, a powerful resolution of multiple forces from which it derives a heightened object quality. In this respect, it could be argued that the house with one wall is a Harmanian object par excellence. The one wall after which the building is named is not so much a label or a brand, but is, rather, the object whose oneness makes possible the house as a whole. If the house has a heightened objectness, then the singular object of the wall makes that objectness both possible and particularly evident. The one wall is both an enduring structure and a system of balances poised in the moment. It is at once a thing unto itself, a thing made from separate constituents, the sand, cement, sand and aggregate of the concrete plus steel reinforcement, and a, and a constituent part of a bigger thing. Without its constituents, it would not be capable of doing what it does. And without the wall's singular integrity, resolving multiple structural loads, the house as a whole could not stand. It is excessive, not least in its reduction of conventional four-square load-bearing wall construction to, uh, towards a more daring and considerably more expensive structural logic. But its excess relies simultaneously on a unity which derives from its own autonomous integrity. Its structural force fields align the house with the wheel world of Harman's metaphysics. The distinctive structure of the house with one wall is such that it almost seems possible to hear and feel the forces at work. In a strong wind, we can imagine the building shifting its weight on its feet almost imperceptibly, slightly compressing the concrete in one floor slab and subtly tensioning the steel reinforcement bars in part of the wall. We can almost imagine watching the deflections at work when a heavy object, a molybdenum Buddha for example, is placed towards the outer edge of one of the floors, seeing the other floors and the wall twisting to compensate. 
This echoes the architect Adam Caruso's description of how he draws architectural details, how he imagines different materials which expand and contract differently, react to rain and snow differently, and weather differently, while pondering their potential assembly. He said, in an interview with myself and one of my co-editors for a book, quote, a working drawing to me is incredibly three-dimensional. Through plan and section, I can imagine each assembly and the way the different materials are leaning on each other or groaning against each other. When you think about materials that way, all materials become equally interesting. Steel and aluminium are so different, and sometimes we use them together. People say you shouldn't, but it's not a problem. You do it because one is bluer, one is warmer, and one is softer. End quote. The direct material consciousness that Caruso evokes as an architect who, in the spirit of Harmon, seems willing to uh, wager on the galvanic series and let the material effects of steel and aluminium loose on one another, is also at work in the house with one wall. The raw materiality of the house is evident. Importantly, this raw materiality is intellectual as well as visual. Its groaning and shifting physicality is palpable, inherent to its diagram, and vital to its constitution. And this raw materiality reinforces the house's heightened objecthood. It is perhaps no coincidence that the one wall and the house that it supports is made primarily of concrete. The glass curtain, although it gives the building its external appearance and keeps the weather out, is subsidiary, both structurally and conceptually. Concrete is a strange material, simultaneously solid and, and, and elusive, as Adrian Forty has noted. Quote, from many of the usual category distinctions through which we make sense of our lives, liquid and solid, smooth and rough, natural and artificial, ancient and modern, base and spirit, concrete manages to escape, slipping back and forth between categories. To say that concrete has a tendency to double, to be two opposite things at once, is not a particularly original observation. Many other commentators on concrete have noted the same thing, though. Um, but they have often been, uh, uh, many other commentators on concrete have noticed, noticed the same thing, though they have often been at a loss with what to do with the inside. End quote. A liquid which becomes solid, concrete is usually given its shape by the formwork into which it's poured, regularly displaying the impress of the shuttering material. Yet it also has its own material properties which determine how it flows, sets, and how it acts when dry. Seemingly self-reliant, it's only really liberated in association with other materials, aggregate and especially steel, which, as hidden reinforcement, greatly extends its structural capacities. Concrete's feel changes hugely and often unpredictably when it's diamond-sawn, bush-hammered, pigmented or shuttered in timber, fabric or stainless steel. So concrete isn't just given form by architects and builders, it's largely self-determining sometimes on its own, sometimes in association with other materials, in its surface characteristics and its depths. These strange self-activating material alchemies, this multiplicity, contribute to the height and object quality of the house with one wall. But the material dimensions of concrete are only one side of its character and are only one constituent of its decisive role in the house. Forty again, quote, Insofar as, there, uh, as, insofar as there are any accepted principles for concrete, they've generally, generally been assumed to belong to its technical properties, and indeed the bulk of what's been written about concrete has come from engineers and chemists. More interesting uh, is, is the description by Sir Thomas More in his Utopia, first published in 1516, of the Houses of the Utopians. Not only does Moore's description mark the beginning of a long-standing association between concrete and utopian movements of all kinds, but it makes clear that concrete has a metaphysics as well as a physics, an existence in the mind parallel to its existence in the world. End quote. So concrete has long had associations with utopias of different kinds, from the ideal geometries of the pantheon to the ideal cities of the modernists. A latent utopianism is part of its mix, it might be argued. A suggestion that offers a reminder here not to make ambitious claims that the house with one wall straightforwardly represents any kind of Harmanian architecture. But it also reminds us that, like Harman's mythical Ferris wheel, bridge, oil rig and tiny calliopes, architectural objects, particularly where they have a special intellectual intensity, can be at once physical objects and objects of metaphysical insight. The house with one wall, it seems to me, is an object of this sort. 
It has a kind of objectness familiar to architects through the presentation of its uh, uh, through the present uh, through the presentation of architectural objects in the professional press, but it also has a kind of objectness that chimes with Harman's writing. Its quiddity seems exceptionally concrete, owing only partially to its having been made in concrete. Okay, on to the last part. The house with one wall exists in my mind like a unicorn or a mermaid. I've not seen it with my own eyes, although I know it well. It remains as real to me as anything more present at hand. The creativity and the intellectual integrity of the architecture serve to anchor the house in my mind. Its singular structural acrobatics, its partie diagram, and the powerful constitutive unity of the wall that configures it stand in my architectural imagination alongside numerous other buildings from across the world, across architectural culture, and throughout architectural history. As an architect, these are the imaginative and intellectual structures that I design with, alongside various artworks, fictions, and pictures from films. I'm familiar with most of these buildings, stories, and, uh, uh, stories and pictures through monographs, journals, websites, and movie clips. I know them through intellectual intimacy rather than merely physical adjacency. The house with one wall is a case in point, known to me through the plans, sections, and photographs published in El Croque. It seems to me that most architects design like this. They construct in their minds whole pleasure parks of imaginative edifices, including galleries and libraries that they stuff with treasures, pacing their grounds in search of inspiration. These enclosures become real spaces of the mind, labyrinths of wonders made for speculative wandering. Like Harman's objects, these fairgrounds exist in the moment. New extensions are built over time while other parts become lost. Some buildings become more prominent and others recede. And, like Harman's objects, the buildings activate or neutralise one another, acting in concert to reshape each other according to the force fields that they enact together. This is no historian's view of architectures situated in their social and material cultures, dealing instead with object lessons for design, those objects rumbling in their depths as actualities different from all events. For example, I sometimes find myself talking about Le Corbusier, Le Corbusier's Carpenter Centre at Harvard in design tutorials with students, drawing its plan and section. Its diagram is famous for the curving ramp that climbs up to a hole cut right through the building, sails across that hole, and then curves down again the other side. In the fairground of my architectural imagination, the Carpenter Centre stands in a neighbourhood near other buildings with holes that the weather snows and hails through including the Pantheon and Dublin's Pierce Street Station, which has a facade that trains regularly pop out from. My carpenter centre, however, is, far, is, is better than Harvard's. At that one, which I was mildly disappointed by when I visited, the ramp begins and ends in places which appear incidental in the city. No one seems to want to go that way across the block. And the main entrance is on the ground floor away from the ramp. In my carpenter centre, the ramp is an important route, route in the city, regularly used by locals, and the main entrance to the building uh, is, is located off the ramp where it pierces through the block, which is where the building seems to signify that it should be. To me, this object is clearly the right carpenter centre, a more satisfactory fulfilment of the promise of its diagram. So that's the one that I tell students about. Also particularly real in my imaginative pleasure grounds at the moment, because I've recently finished a book about it, is Leslie Martin's unbuilt design for London's Whitehall, a grand plan published in 1965 to demolish most of London's historic government district and replace its 19th century palaces of state with a ziggurat section megastructure built in concrete. By no means modest in conception, scope or scale, it would have spanned the roads into Parliament Square, reframing the Houses of Parliament and Westminster Abbey. It was conceived as a symbol of a scientific, purposeful and meritocratic 1960s future whose other trophies included Concord, the Moonshots and the Post Office Tower. It's an object of fascination because it stands for a welfare state Britain whose, ar whose architecture is being erased just as its liberal values are gradually being eroded. It's also notable as an architecture produced directly out of a functional diagram derived from uh, daylight studies and land use efficiency calculations where the diagram is ruthlessly pasted into the site with only passing regard for its morphology. In my pleasure grounds, a broad public arcade that Martin designed for Whitehall through the megastructure from the Thames to St James's Park connects both physically and intellectually with the ramp through the Carpenter Centre, conceived at a similar time according to similar values. 
Fortunately, while Martin's Whitehall would have demolished the previous one, both are able to coexist together in the fairground, along with Christopher Wren's 17th century Whitehall, which was equally ambitious and equally unbuilt. In another corner of the grounds is an altogether different landscape, a park within a park. Named our Miller, it's a curious and striking presence glinting in the sun. I came to it first through Italo Calvino's novel Invisible Cities, which is an architecture student staple. Long abandoned by its residents, our Miller's buildings have crumbled away to leave only the plumbing, the wash basins, WC pans and bidets, and the pipes that connect them hanging in midair. Our Miller is striking not just because of the powerful impression it leaves in the minds of people who visit it. It's also a powerful picture of contemporary architecture at a time when 40 to 50% of construction budgets are regularly spent on building services, when buildings are wired for lighting, power, data, security and audio, and packed with plant to cool, heat and recycle air. The ruins of our Miller show how architecture is increasingly understood as a container of pipes, ducts and cables, and how historic buildings are repurposed as carriers of cables, accessorised with plastic trunking, suspended ceilings and cable trays. Indeed, in a strange refolding of the fairground map, the service runs of the Carpenter Centre and Martin's Whitehall also exist as ruins in our miller. Simultaneously, the twisting tubes of our miller's truncated limbs exist as a real and present part of those buildings and all the other buildings in the park. These three edifices, the Carpenter Centre, Martin's Whitehall plan and our miller, which could be categorised superficially as built, unbuilt and fantasy, stand prominently in a, comp in a complex mental landscape which I walk around regularly and which feeds my designing imagination. The grounds also incorporate the house with one wall. Each building has a heightened object quality. Echoing Harmon's wheel world, they all have a special intellectual intensity at a particular moment in time. They're simultaneously singular and multiple, past and future, present and real. They have surface qualities and depths, they're concrete things creaking and groaning together in a complex structural system whose forces are finely balanced. The same buildings coexist simultaneously in other architects' imaginative pleasure grounds, although they're configured differently there. Just as my house with one wall oscillates between oneness and multiplicity, balancing complex forces in a momentary structural unity, so another architect's house with one wall might be a housing typology or an exemplary curtain wall. Just as my carpenter centre is a diagram of a building with a hole in it, pierced by a ramp to be improved by shifting the entrance and reconfiguring the territory around it. So another architect's carpenter centre is an assembly of brief silai or a colour palette. None of these carpenter centres or houses with one wall are the same, and none of them are more, more or less concrete than the versions of them published in the magazines or the ones which stand in, Har in a Harvard street or a Zurich suburb. These buildings which exist in architects' imaginations may prove more powerful than the ones in Massachusetts and Switzerland, however. Their reality derives from their effects. They are detonating generators on the ferris wheel of design. Their parts are waiting to explode into as yet unimagined architectures, although their consequences are too uncertain to predict. As real imaginaries, tangible fictions, they're ready to exert their power, generating unexpected force fields between them uh, between them and with other objects in the world. Thinking the canonical objects of architecture in the light of Harman's wheel world, picturing them as constituent parts of the charged object of design imagination, helps to reimagine the architectural canon anew. The Circus Philosophicus makes a powerful case for what I would like to call the Circus Architectura, the group of imaginary but concrete objects which shape architecture as most architects understand it the architectural universe that exists in architects' minds and whose presence is reasserted whenever those architects design. Following the lessons of cultural studies, we've become accustomed to condemning the canon because of what, who and where it excludes. But this is to imagine the canon as a static edifice rather than as the sum of shifting force fields. It forgets that those force fields can change in new and unpredictable ways when dormant background objects become recharged and burst forward, disrupting the equilibrium. It's common to criticise the architectural press for publishing buildings as though they were objects unto themselves. Buildings are usually depicted in isolation, empty apart from a handful of specimen furniture objects with untidy surroundings and unruly occupants cropped out in order to maintain some fiction of pure architecture. 
Drawings are cropped tightly to the object and seldom easy to read in context. It's often claimed that architects fail to engage with real people in real contexts, making over self-referential architectures because the press encourages them to think of buildings in terms of the images that photographers shoot. But this is also how architects' imaginative pleasure grounds are uh, constituted. Maybe it's not so much that the press produces a culture of self-referential objects, than those objects instead produce their own reality through the effects they exert on architects' imaginations. The objects of the canon reproduce and replicate in the circus architecture, shifting and mutating through multiple reappropriations and reconstructions. Numerous houses with one wall, in conjunction with countless, countless other architectural objects, spark off each other to produce types and variants at other scales, in other contexts, and for other clients. It seems entirely appropriate to constitute this concrete universe of the architectural canon as a circus, it has its high-wire acts, halls of mirrors, freak shows, and disappearing women. Like any circus, it's simultaneously spectacular and intimidating, delightful and repulsive, highly regulated and lawless, of the real world while conjuring up its own alternative reality. New acts join old ones, and old ones retire. Like any fairground, we enjoy being amazed by the circus architecture. Most people like visiting, but few would want to live there. Graham Harmon and the House with One Wall help us to see these objects of the architectural circus in their place as a heightened reality. The circus remains surprising, anarchic and vital, a necessary part of the designing imagination. We should be careful what we build there, but we should never dampen its spirit. That's it. The slides didn't really line up with where they might have done, but that's all part of it. So do we have any, any questions? While you're thinking of questions, I'll, I'll, um, I'll ask one. Um, Adam, it seems really great that the way you thought through Harman's philosophy and a different register for us, thinking of how the kind of... the um, mermaids and unicorns of the architectural discipline operate chaotically uh, with each other. I guess my question is how we think through the, um, the relationship between the Circus Architectura and the Circus Philosophicus, or how these fictions that we play with in the architect's imagination uh, translate or have impacts or kind of construct uh, the object and, and what kind of effects that has or even the politics of that, or how we kind of begin to theorize more than just a, um, you know, a kind of surreal juxtaposition of like rotating fairground wheels uh, that's all chaotic. Well, I mean, the, circ the, the stories, the myths of the circus architecture are, are constituted around uh, responses to other philosophies, to previous philosophies, and I guess, the circus architecture, in the way I imagine it, operates similarly. You know that it's it's not just a negotiation uh, of objects. That you know, th th it's it's partly about the, the resonances of those objects as well, and the strange resonances that they have together and with us as human objects, and with, I guess, what Harman would consider their you know the kind of stories about their history, which he would imagine as other kinds of objects. I guess in this house in particular, the, the question might be the if, the if the single wall idea is a kind of unicorn of architectural imagination. Um, you said at the beginning that architects construct these fictions as a way to kind of persuade their clients. Maybe there's a question there about the kind of instrumentality of these unicorns and mermaids in the hands of architects, or um, in a way, what kind of effects that single wall is, is having beyond the, beyond the magazine. I guess it's the same question again, but um, yeah, at the back there. Hang on a second, the mic's coming. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I might have misread what you were saying about the circus, but I was slightly concerned that it seemed to be a circus that drew almost exclusively on an architectural canon. And I wondered where the place of other kinds of 
um, objects or experiences that influence architects and create architecture would be within that circus. Mm -hmm. um, because I feel that teaching architecture and practicing as an artist, I'm between two worlds which actually have very mm -hmm. strong influences on each other. Mm -hmm. So I was just wondering if you could say something about that and how you think that the worlds of art and architecture might work between each other. Yeah, I mean, I, uh, yes, I, I guess I picked particularly architectural examples, but you know, the the um, the objects of architects' imaginations include all sorts, you know, include art and sculpture and film and you know all kinds of other things as well. I think I did mention it briefly, but you know, I could have chosen better examples to emphasise that. Um, and I think absolutely, you know, the the the, the those objects and the force fields that they have between them in, the archite in, in, in an architectural imagination are incredibly important. And in a way, the more diversity there is, the richer the, the, the interactions of the force field. But, but in a way, when we're talking about objects, film is a very different thing to an architectural element. Mm -hmm. So I just wondered if you could, I mean, I'm quite new to Harmon's work, but... So am I. <laughs> if you could explain how you thought that yeah. those different kind of influences might fit within the philosophy that he's, he's kind of proposing, because they're not all objects, actually. I mean, well, I think for Harmon they would all be objects of, of different kinds. Um, you know, I mean, uh, one of the things that... I've been trying to. You know, it's the, the, uh, it's really interesting in grappling with Harman's work is the way that um, everything is an object. Even even agency is an object of a kind. Or uh, you know, and you often feel that he's struggling quite hard to try and make everything into an object. Um, but you know, I guess I mean, I, you know, trying to answer it from a Harmanian perspective is quite difficult for me. There are probably other people in this room who could do it much better. But I guess the material qualities and the, you know, the, the inherent objectness of each object is always hugely diverse. And therefore, uh, you know, the, the interactions between things are equally diverse. Thank you. <laughs> Hi, um, Hi there. That was really enjoyable. Thank you. Um, I think you're right to, to pick on Christian Keres. I think that they, he and Harman exhibit a similar cultural phenomena. Um, it was really refreshing at the penultimate Venice Biennale um, after having been assaulted with what a friend of mine called um, Stormtrooper's cod pieces in lieu of Delusian... Um, uh, I don't know what it's supposed to be, but it was basically a load of bollocks. And then suddenly there were these kind of pure objects that seemed to relate to architecture as a discipline. And um, the thing that was refreshing about reading Harman and seeing Kerez and Old Giatu, the new group of Swiss architects dealing with um, structure as a way to make space, um, is the thing that leaves me slightly lacking, which is that um, whilst the house that you've described is interesting intellectually as um, a typology, as far as I'm aware, it was a speculative development without a client. And so it operates a bit like the kind of speculative realism that Harmon engages in. I, it is exactly like an object in the circus, but a circus is not a city. And the, the, the school project that Carrez exhibited in the Biennale that he showed being made was, was also refreshingly great to somebody just showing a building being made. And it had these huge spans achieved for the gymnasium by bits of steel, and you saw them being craned onto site and welded together, and it was fantastic, because instead of that, what you'd seen a few years before was a bunch of people at American universities showing stormtroopers cod pieces in lieu of building any buildings or writing any books, but that was supposed to be seen as some form of speculation. But 
the school project, I think, for Carreras, that's carried out, worked brilliantly because there was lots of change happening in this complex structure. But the problem with the house for me is, as an architect, and also the problem with objecthood generally, is that when you start to think about how it engages with the, si the city, you go, are these garage doors? No, they're actually two doors into a house which is autonomous to itself. And where's the fucking sun come from? And oh god, it's using a shitload of energy to cool itself. And can you open a window? Now all of those are equipmental problems of architecture that tend to disappear when you reduce it to a question of structure as type. Now whilst those th things exist in a kind of museum of interesting inspiration for architecture students, are they really engaging with the manifold aspects of objecthood that Heidegger refers us to through phases like Sorge and Umsicht and Umgang, i.e. dealings and worldhood, etc. And um, it, the, the thing that occurred to me earlier when you asked the question about why does it matter if the clicker breaks, is it matters because it's really socially embarrassing if you're giving a talk and the clicker breaks. I.e. this is a room for a particular social setting. The things within it are set up to enable those things to happen and they have emotional and um, also um, a communicative relevance. Now one of the problems of architecture is it tends to foreground the things that should be background. I.e. the whole building becomes a clicker. A building looks like a pair of binoculars because it happens to sell the binoculars or whatever. So what you're talking about, I think, tonight, both you guys, is this problem of the disappearance of the function of something into its revelation of something else. But surely the revelation of that something else isn't the object, it's its place in the world, which enables the metaphor of tool to stand in for solipsistic introverted subjectivity which is the thing which really Harman is grappling with um, but I'll repeat a circus is not a city <laughs> and perhaps a city is unlike a circus is made up not of objects but of types because they address difficult situations and in the past we would have a clicker now we have a clicker now in the past it would have been next slide please and before that it would have been pictures on an easel. So the object may, ch may change, but the situation remains stable. M uh, Patrick, maybe I can add to that, because it seems like the figure of circus is, is a kind of chaotic figure that m perhaps emphasizes l l lawlessness over regulation. I mean, you said they were kind of both re were in play, but it's, it's, a, it's a kind of surreal chaos of of juxtapositions in, in the real world. But maybe um, circus is one motif that works alongside another motif, let's say the, th the theatre or something, something that includes um, narrative structures, thematic structures, the order between objects, um, regulation or something. So maybe, but maybe they're not mutually exclusive. Maybe objects are part of a circus in the background that we're all, you know, outside of human perception but they're also at the simultaneously part of a kind of theatre world or a city that's... Uh, I and I guess we're struggling to wrestle with how they're both at the same time. I think it's interesting that, that somebody described Harman's work as being like film noir because it's clearly that it's an American sensibility that's at play. It reminds me of the early work of Paul Auster and of people writing in LA where the city is a network and system with a series of objects and then you get a serial disjunction or encounter that breaks that system. But it's interesting that he's now talking about and writing about living in Cairo and his room in Cairo. And I think when he comes here, it would be interesting to expand this uh, question of the autonomy of things versus the ecology of field to, to talk about what it's like to live with tradition and to live with accumulation of language, that kind of r rocket trail stuff that, that, that especially as he's living there whilst stuff is happening to objects and to fields where people are building stuff that stops people doing things. Is there any, any other questions as well? John, Jonathan, Jonathan over here. <laughs>
Yeah, I, I think trying to pick up on what um, Patrick was talking about, I just wondered if you had a view on um, that question about type or typologies, build, building types. I mean, there's something in terms of a kind of urban language, if you like, a kind of um, sense that we, we can kind of navigate unfamiliar places through some kind of recognisa recognisability, you know, that the building types have. But I, I wonder if in Harman's um, whole system, or it's philosophy really, that there's, there's room for classifications of objects in, into types, whether you, you find that. Because it's one of the things I found reading the uh, quadruple object, which I, I kind of enjoyed up to, you know, maybe two thirds of the way through. I started to get kind of bogged down um, at some point in the argument where he talks about um, real, he's trying to make, he wants, seems to want four things for some reason. He wants a fourfold that's equivalent to Heidegger's fourfold. Um, so he invents, he has sensory objects, um, and then what they have sensory qualities, which one can derive from them. Okay, that's fine, those are experiential things. But then he has real objects, which are these kind of intellectual, these things we can intuit behind that are out there somewhere that he's trying, desperately trying to theorize. But he suggests that the, the real objects have real qualities. Um, and I couldn't follow that bit of the argument. I just couldn't see how he could find a place for what he calls real qualities without starting to make classifications between objects that I felt, well, you have to, at that point, you have to say who those classifications are for. You know, who's making those decisions about what counts as a type of, a certain type of object, lamps, tables, tigers, whatever they are. Um, and I just wondered if we have maybe have a similar problem then when we come to a conversation about architectural types, that it's difficult to find a place for those, or it would be difficult for Harman to, to, to kind of find a place for those things. Do you have a, a view on that? <laughs> well, yeah, I mean, like you, I, you know, I struggled to get my head around those, the, those four, that quadru particular quadraphonics. Um, that's a really interesting question. Yeah, I mean, he does, I see most of the time he does seem to try really hard to avoid categorizations. Objects are always themselves, first and foremost. Um, but I, w would he think of a, categorize, you know, a category of objects as being another object? I like the surface. Yeah. I think. I mean, I think he said. You know, he says that objects are always themselves. They're always parts. They're always also parts of other things. So there is this kind of multiplicity, as well as the unity. It's quite hard to get your head round. <laughs> I have a question. Yeah, go on. <laughs> Um, well, it's about juxtaposition of objects, um, because in, as, as you have um, been exploring in the Circus Philosophicus, um, Graham Harmon um, lo seems to love um, describing all these very different objects coming together and creating these new objects. And it's also something Jonathan picked up on was... Um, the the entertaining quality of these examples and scenarios, and I was wondering if humour is how humour fits into this ontology. A quite a general question. It should. <laughs> um, I don't think I don't know if I have an answer to that. I'd like to think about it though. Well, uh, yeah, question in the uh, question at the back there, and you. Yeah. Oh. Um, yeah, I'm an artist uh, rather than an architect, and um, I suppose in a sense I'm doing a PhD as well, and I see Harman's work as a sort of challenge, I suppose, to, to what I do. I'm, I'm interested in why uh, some architects, I don't know if this is a big thing in architecture, but it seems to be, why are architects so interested in, in Graham Harman's work? Um, I mean, I guess, you know, I, I suppose maybe like artists, is if you're, you feel that what you do is you know you're involved in the making of objects. Any uh, you know any attempt to interrogate what an object is or to think about how it works is inherently interesting and fascinating. Um, I mean I've only you know I've only been puzzling with it since I had the invitation from these guys um, a month or so ago. Uh, and there are all sorts of things I don't feel I am able to locate yet. I don't feel like I understand how 
where agency is in all of this, an object-oriented world. You know, is, agency seems to be another object. Or another, you know, but I, again, I, it'd be really interesting to talk to Graham Harmon about that and tease it out a bit. I mean, is it partly because Heidegger is um, very important in architectural theory, and, and Harmon's obviously dealing with Heidegger? Is, is that? I th- I'm sure. Sh- yes, I'm sure that's part of it too. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, m- maybe as, as, as myself and Jess kind of instigated the the kind of exchange, uh, we're slightly responsible for kind of the kind of question of urgency of Harmon and architecture relating to each other. M- my sense is that, um, like the humanities in general, there's been a kind of um, the turn towards language has had kind of dominance in the last 20 years. And it's not just Harman's work, it's Latour, it's Delanda. There's, there's a kind of realism that's re-emerged that we're all interested in with the sense that have we kind of fallen back a little too far into everything's language and there's kind of a relativism that has crept in. And I think Harman kind of promises um, to encounter the real a- again um, and somehow bridge the humanities sciences divide that we all sense that we, we kind of want to bridge. But I think the thing we struggle with perhaps is, you know, science offers us a very clear um, consequences to its representations of the real. We know what to do with that in relationship to the to the world. And we're all sort of struggling a little bit with a kind of an ontology, a philosophy that can tell us about the real. And then what do we do do with that? But it's but but just to speak to it's kind of a I think it's kind of basically timely in that that we're trying to think maybe beyond and outside of our kind of imprisonment within language. Any, any more questions? That might be the moment to end, yeah. it, it? Yeah, so, okay, let's, r- let's wrap up. And um, thank you all for coming. And our third event in the series is going to be on May 29th, on Wednesday, back here, two weeks' time. We're going to have Peter Carl and Lawrence Holm. Uh, so... Please, please come back for the third event. Okay. Thank you very much, and, and thank you for sorry. Thank you for Jonathan Hale and Adam Shaw. Thank you.